Hello! Um, this is going to be the Abacus training um, and it is relevant. Right now we're in 2013 and um, that's the last time this was updated. It was recently this year. So if you're looking at this in the future, there might be some extra slides depending on further developments with Abacus. Um, one thing I do want to say before going into this PowerPoint is that Abacus is designed to be flexible. So once you get familiar with Abacus after using it for a while, you'll realize that there's usually more than one way to do pretty much everything I'm going to explain in this PowerPoint um, because there's um, you can basically do everything from different angles and different ways. So don't get confused if you, in your own practice of using Abacus, if you discover something that is slightly different than what I the way I described it here because um, it's just kind of how you're comfortable using it um, but the ways that I describe all the functions here in Abacus are kind of a, a way to have, basic, have a basic understanding of the use of Abacus so hopefully it'll be helpful to you. Um, the other thing I want to say before going into it is that this is very dense uh, with information and so it's good to kind of watch this before your first time using Abacus but it's also really important to refer back to it um, because you'll find that a lot of this might not even really make sense until you're actually doing it in Abacus and then you'll say, oh, how did I do, how am I supposed to do this one specific thing? And then you can come back to the PowerPoint and um, look at it again. It might be really helpful as a, to refer back onto it once you're more familiar. So going into it, the first thing you need to do is log in to Abacus and Abacus is connected through a remote server. Um, so you need to double click on the Abacus desktop icon that's on your normal desktop. And when you do that, a whole new desktop will come up. Um, and you can kind of toggle back between that desktop and your normal desktop. Um, but you can also access the internet and different things in the Abacus desktop as well. But I'll talk about that. Um, so the first thing you're going to do is enter your, it'll ask for your credentials, which are your first and last initial. Um, if you're a new staff member or a volunteer, I would ask your supervisor first um, if your Abacus is set up yet or what credentials you should use. But it's usually your initials. So that's your username and password is the same thing. Um, and then the, other, the last thing it says here is if you do have a, an icon on your desktop that says Abacus Win, that's an outdated version, which is a, a copy of the older version of Abacus. It shouldn't be there, but just in case it is, um, don't use that because if you put new information in there, it won't save onto the actual Abacus. Um, so to make sure you're in the right one, that's why this arrow is here. It should say version V22, which is version 22 and then data 01, that's what it should say at the top of your screen. And if it says V21, which is the previous version, then you are in the wrong version of Abacus. So you're in, now you're in. Um, and the biggest concept that you need to understand about Abacus, which might take a little bit, um, is that Abacus is made up of contacts and matters. And it's all about the interaction of the context, contacts and the matters which is, it leads to the complexity and the flexibility of Abacus because basically your contacts are all the people, all the individuals you're going to be dealing with and their biographical information and contact information and the matters are the things, like the, the case types, the retainers that you're going to be dealing with and they both, both of these things, the contacts and the matters, connect to each other and you can access both through the other one too so if you're in a matter, you can access all the contacts that are connected to that matter and vice versa. If you're in a contact, you can access all the matters that are related to that contact, which leads to what I said before, that you can do everything in two different ways because you can access both of these from the other one. Um, another thing that you can kind of get in your head is that the, the contact page is always blue and the matter page is always like a gold or yellow color. So. If you're confused of if you're in a matter page or a contact page, the first thing you can look at is the color of it. Matters are going to be gold and the contacts are going to be blue. So here I just have some examples of, of what your contacts and matters might be. Um, contacts mostly are clients, um, derivatives, law enforcement agencies, psychologists, basically any person um, that has contact information. And matters can be all your retainer types. So U visa, U concert processing, adjustment of status, VAWA, SIGES, etc. And matters usually correspond with a retainer. So if you have a new retainer, it's going to be a new matter. So um, the next thing you might want to do is to find a client of yours. Um, and again, there's more than one way to do this, but the way I show it here is by using the icons at the top of the screen, not the drop down menus. 
So it makes it easier because it's just an icon you can click on. So here, um, if you're following along, you might be able to see this better on your own computer. The icon says names. That's the contact page. So if you click on names, you'll get this blue screen that has all the, um, the fields for your client. So it'll have um, like their name, middle name, date of birth, all that stuff. Um, and to search for it, when you click on names to search for your client, start with their last name. And most of our clients will have two last names. And it's really important because there we have a lot of clients. So if you just type in Hernandez, there's going to be like 400 results. So you have to type in both of their last names and then comma, space, first, middle. And then you'll, your client should pop up. And um, if your client has a unique name, it'll probably pop up sooner. But if not, you're going to have to type the whole thing for it to pop up. And you can practice that. Um, and then looking up a little bit closer, the contact screen, the main page is demographics. It says one demographics. And that's where it has all your client's information. Um, and whenever you do get a new client, it is important to try and fill out all of these fields because that's what makes Abacus relevant and useful is when all the information is in there um, for whoever needs it and for your forms too, which we'll go over. Um, the second tab on the contact page is for notes, but it's we would like to not have notes there um, just because the notes, uh, it's more logical to save them under the matters since that's the actual retainer you're working on instead of the contact, instead of the person's name. The only time I write a note in the contact page is if it's like something really odd about that person that you need to know that has to do with their contact information or how you're going to contact them. So if there's like a long explanation about their address or something, you could you could write in one of these fields, see contact note, and then maybe write a note saying, you know, whatever you need to do about the contact. But as far as notes on the case, those need to be saved under the matter screen that corresponds to that case. So here I wrote, do not add notes here. Um, if you do add a note here and you don't connect it to the matter, it's going to be lost unless someone goes specifically into the contact to find it, which is inconvenient and confusing. So it's really important to not write notes in the blue contact screen. The next tab on the contacts is linked matters. And this is where you can access all the different retainers that are connected to that person. So. In this, this example, this is a made up client, um, but this client has a U visa case, a U adjustment case, and a naturalization case. All three are separate matters attached to the client. Um, and if your blue screen, in this case it is a client, but if your blue screen is not a client, for example, if it's a law enforcement agency like Oakland Police Department, um, its linked matters can be different. And we can, you can connect the matter for that client to the law enforcement agency so that once you open the law enforcement agency contact page, you can see all the cases that they're helping with. So it can be useful for that too. Um, so in order to get to the matter you want to work on, this is one way of doing it. If you're in the contact page, you can just select the matter that you want to work on. In this case, it's highlighting the U adjustment of status matter and double click on it. And then it'll open up the matter for that that um, connection that was made. So here's what the matter screen looks like and you can see it is golden colored and it does say matter up here in the screen too. Um, and then the first tab, remember on the contacts page the first tab was demographics. Here the first tab says immigration so it has, it's more based on the, the retainer that they're doing. Um, so the golden screen is where you're going to save all the notes about that client's case and also all of the linked names to that case, linked events, linked forms, which is docs here, and um, everything associated with that specific retainer or case. And as I said earlier, the golden matter screen represents a separate retainer contract. Um, so you can look at this and see all the information in here. It has the attorney, the staff assigned the date the retainer signed, um, again it's going to have the client's name and our file number and everything. Um, so continuing. So this is where you are going to save your case notes and this is really important. Um, so the second tab is notes. If you click on the second tab under the matter screen. So to add a note, you go down to the bottom of the matter screen where it says add and click that and then you're going to get this pop up. Um, and you can add your note, which in this case was had an intake with the client. Um, there's several types of notes, so you can pick that and then you can click OK. If you're trying to track the case, you can also enter the number of minutes 
that you spent on that task in this little box manually or there's a little clock function that's pretty easy to use too. Um, so here it says write specific notes and put your initials at the end of the note if you are not staff. If you're not staff and you don't have your own abacus credentials, then that it is important to write your initials at the end of your note so the caseworker in the future will know who wrote that. But if you have your own abacus account, it should have your initials where it says operator. So then anyone can go in and see who made that note. And if you happen to be, for whatever reason, accessing Abacus from someone else's computer really quickly, you can also just manually change the operator field to your own initials um, so that it shows that you wrote the note, too. So then once you're done, you click OK. And these are all the case note categories. This could have changed because um, uh, I think administration can add or you know edit these note categories. But... Um, Usually we try to make the note category reflect the action that was done. So, for example, the category intake, I wouldn't write that if I was scheduling an intake because I wasn't actually doing the intake. So if I called a client to schedule an intake, the note category would be phone out because I called them, and then the note content would say called client and scheduled intake. And then when the caseworker actually does the intake, that's when you would use the category intake. So try as much as possible, I mean, it's not always going to be 100% that way, but as much as you can, try to make the note category reflect the action you took on the case when you touched it. And we do ask that you do write a note every time you touch the case so that anyone who looks at it can um, see what's, what's the latest on that case. And that's what I just said. So when to add case note is always, um, there is a balance. You don't want to write a huge paragraph every time you like think about the case, but it is important to make a little note if you did something on that case. Um, like if the client calls, or if the police officer calls about the case, or if you get a fax related to the case, if you had your declaration appointment, if the client came to pay fees, everything that is going on with that case. Because um, we work as a team, so it is very important to note everything so that anyone in the future could look back and know what's going on with your case. Um, so now we're going to go over adding a new case. Now that we've gone over what is a contact, what is a matter, and how to find both of those through searching on the icons, um, you'll be adding a new case before the intake stage when you have first contact with the client um, and you're determining that they, they do want to try to be a client and submit their case to us for us to look at it and have an intake with them. So you will add a new contact, add a new matter, and then link the two. And again, you can do this in any order. You can do the matter first, contact first, and then link them separately. But I'm just um, going to go through how it's outlined here um, to create the two and then link them together. So the reason I created the contact first in this, um, or I usually always create the contact first, is because when you're talking to the client on the phone, you're going to ask them for their phone number and their, usually their full name, date of birth, and phone number so that you can distinguish them from other clients which this is not information that's easy to put straight into the matter screen. So it makes more sense to open up the contact screen to put in their biographical and contact information. So go back to, and click the contacts icon again, and you'll get the same pop-up. And a little note here says, don't let these names confuse you. The contact, it, it is for convenience. It always pops up with the last name that you were working on, and then followed by in alphabetical order, all the other clients afterwards. So that doesn't mean that you have to click that. It just does that for your convenience in case you wanted to access that again. But here you're going to click add to add a new person. Um, and that add button, it's important to distinguish between add and OK. Both here and when you click on the matters tab, it gives you the same choices. Because if you click add, you're creating a new thing. So keep that in mind. Don't just click add unless you, you are trying to create a new person or a new retainer. Otherwise, you're always going to be clicking OK if you're trying to select something. So in this case, we are creating a new person, so click Add. And the first thing that will come up is it's going to prompt you to enter the class entry. Um, and for this one, we're going to use Client. Um, but they also have lots of other choices like Derivative, Counselor, Attorney, um, Law Enforcement Agency, whatever. So we're going to choose Client. So highlight that and click OK. Also, anytime there's a drop-down menu in Abacus, if you know what the category is, you can just start typing it and it'll pre-fill it for you. So you don't always have to, once you get familiar with the categories, you don't always have to use the drop-down menu to scroll and find it. If you just start typing it, it'll fill it in for you and then you can click OK. But here we just showed the drop-down menu so you can see it. 
So click client and then OK, or you can double click client and it'll go through. And then um, it'll give, this is what it'll look like when before you click OK. And then it'll pop up with this. So this part can be a tiny bit stressful because you do need to use speed here in order for you to be successful right here. Because what happens is there's a lot of users in Abacus um, throughout the three ICWIC offices and anyone can be creating a new person at any time. So each time you create a new person, Abacus assigns it an internal number for that person. So if two people are opening a new person at the same time and they haven't clicked save yet, Abacus is assuming the same number for both of those people. So if the other person clicks save before you, Abacus is going to give you an error message and say that the, the ID is already in use. So, and that sometimes causes Abacus to go into this override thing. So what you need to do is type in the client's name as quickly as you can and then click save before you do anything else so that you can preserve your unique ID number. Um, if you do go into the thing where it tells you that you can't enter it because someone else is already using it, don't create your own ID number because that will throw off Abacus as well. You just have to click cancel until you go out of it. And I think it goes over this that later step by step here. Um, but anyway, so the first thing you want to do is write their two last names and their first name and click save. And then you can continue to fill out the rest of the form. Um, I have gotten the question before, oh, well, can I just type like one letter and click save? And that, unfortunately, the answer to that is no as well, because if it's exactly the same as any other thing in Abacus, it'll give you an error message saying, warning, that is already in use too. Like if it's, you just type an H and click save, it won't let you do that. So try to type in as, as accurately as possible the client's name and click save. And then fill in all the information in the demographics tab and then press save again. Um, and then you can close the blue screen by clicking the little X once you're done with that. Um, and then we're going to create a matter. So it's pretty much the same thing. Um, so click the matters icon and click add again and go through the same process. And try to save immediately after entering the client's name. Um, so this is the same type of thing. The, the difference here is that instead of the type of person, it's going to ask you for the type of case. So it asks for a class code, um, which is where you choose UBrief service, UBisa, VAWA, etc. And if you are on the phone with a client who's just now going to send in his or her police report and have us review it for them, it's always going to be, well, if it's a U visa, U brief service, um, before it turns into a retainer. And then the caseworker can change it to the, the full case type in the intake stage. So here um, we're going to choose you know, one of the class code entries for the type of case and click OK. And then after you type in their last name, last name, comma, first name, middle name, you can click save. And then um, the reason there's a circle right here is once a matter is linked to a contact, this will pre-fill with links to all the information on the contact page. But here it says not linked because we haven't linked them yet. So um, once you save the matter page that you just created, we're going to go ahead and link those together. So in the, you're in the matter page. You were on the immigration tab when you just finished saving that new information. Now if you click over to the linked names tab, the bottom um, choice here is add link. So click that. And then you'll get a blue screen with choices of what name you want to link to it. So again, don't click add here. That might seem like the logical thing to do, but if you click add, you're going to be creating a new person again. So what you want to do is find your client and click OK. Um, conveniently, since you just added the new client, um, it will be the first name that pops up because that's how Abacus um, starts its every new field with the last thing you did. So here it is, the, the client I just created is the first name that pops up, so all I have to do is click OK. Um, and then it'll give you a little pop-up to ask you what type is, what is the link type. So most of the time here, you want it to say applicant. In order for it to fill the forms correctly, don't, don't put client here. It's a little bit confusing, but it, with practice you'll get into the habit of doing this. Um, so link type, if you just type APP or search for applicant, that's what you want. And then once you click down to the second box, it'll pre-fill the word applicant for you. Um, here, when you're linking a name to a contact where it says description, it pre-fills this field with the full word of whatever the link type abbreviation is automatically. 
but you can change it. So if you want to change this field, you can. And we'll go over when you can, I mean, you can always do it, but I think later here it goes over um, how to do that. So now your new matter and your new client are linked together because um, we created a client or a contact page, we created a matter page and we linked them based on the applicant. Um, and if this is two separate screenshots, so if you're in the matter page and you go to linked names, you should see a little line that has your, your contact in there. And if you double click on that, you'll get this screen where you see your um, contact page and if you go to linked matters, you should see the matter. So basically, if you go into either one, you can find the other one linked to it. So now you have linked them together. Um, you can create multiple names to one matter and multiple matters to one name. So that's the, the flexibility of Abacus. If you have derivatives, you will be creating a different contact page for each derivative and connecting it back to the matter for the principal. And in that case, the link type won't be applicant, it'll be derivative. Um, and you can experiment with that a little bit. So we're going to move on to different functions in Abacus now that you know how to create a contact and create a matter and link them together. So adding a new matter on an already existing case. This is if you're going to sign a new retainer for the same client for a different service. Um, so we're going to use the clone function to save a lot of time. Um, for example, if you have a UBISA case that was approved and three years have passed and now you're doing adjustment for that same client, that's when you can use this clone function to make, create the new retainer or matter for adjustment. Um, if they are suddenly in removal proceedings, you need a new matter for their proceedings, an EAD renewal for a valid case, etc. Anytime you're doing a new retainer, you can use this. Um, so you're going to make a new matter on an existing case. In order to open a new matter, Go to the blue screen for the client, the contact page, um, by searching, as we did earlier, through the contact um, function or by quick query if you can't find the client, and it, we go into that in more detail in the troubleshooting section. Um, so what you can do is you can double click on one of the already existing matters, preferably the first open matter, in this case is a UV set. So, but any of them will work. So if you go into any of the matters that are connected to that client, then you can go down and click clone and it'll give you a new field with a different ID number and you can make your changes to it and click save and it'll be a totally new matter. So um, what you, the first thing you want to do after you clone it is change the case type because the reason you're doing a new matter is because you have a new case. So um, you can change the case type to the new matter type or if it's, you know, now you're doing adjustment you want to change it from UVSA to AOS so that's under case type. Um, change the re retainer signs date and the case status. So here it previously will probably say close because you finished that old retainer and now you have a new retainer. So make sure that says open now. Um, and then if you just signed a new retainer for a new thing, that's obviously a different date. And then down here, it'll probably say, it'll probably have a date that it was closed. I think this looks a little bit different now, um, but it's the same concept. If it says the case was closed on a certain date for a reason, erase both of those fields because you're now opening a new one. And then after entering your changes, click save, and then you can close that screen. Um, and then now the problem when you clone it, not a problem, but when you clone a matter or a contact, it doesn't automatically relink to each other anymore. So you have to create that link again. So um, go to the blue screen or either screen and go to link to matters. Or if you're in the contact, I mean, if you're in the matter, then you'll have to go to link to names. So in this case, we're in the blue screen, so we're going to link to matters. And um, click add link down here. And when you click that link, all the names will appear. And again, it's likely that your client will be the first person there because you just worked on that. And then click OK to link them. And again, don't click add because add is creating a new thing again. So just click OK to link them together. And it again will we'll prompt you to tell it what type of link it is. And usually it's going to be applicant. Um, and then you can let it do its own description or you can change the description if you want. And then you can click OK. Um, when you're doing a new link type on a case that you already have previous retainers for, the reason I changed this to SIGES is because you have different um, 
different case codes already for the different cases. So if you want to distinguish between what case it is, you can write, for the description, you can write, you know, what type of case here. Um, you don't have to know. Um, and then you can click OK and you can make sure it appears, you can make sure they're linked by going to the matter screen and trying to find this contact linked to it. And if it's not, then you didn't do it right. So you can try again. So yeah, once you link it, it should appear there. Um, as a new a new link in your match screen or here it's in your contact screen but yes so you can also clone contacts the same way um, the way you just clone the matter screen they have the same options on the contact screen um, and you can clone contacts if you're adding multiple derivatives who have the same address and native country and all that so you don't have to re-enter it a bunch of times it's all, I find it's really convenient for child derivatives that have the same contact information as their parents um, you can just clone them so that they don't, you don't have to rewrite everything again. Um, but anytime you use the clone function, make sure you link it back to the, if you're cloning a matter, make sure you link it back to the contact. And then if you're cloning a contact, make sure you link it back to the matter afterwards. Otherwise, it's just floating all by itself, not connected to anything. Okay, so abacus contacts that are not clients. Um, these can be various individuals related to the case, like family members who are not derivatives. In some cases, if it's a child, um, sometimes a family member will be doing all the work for the case, but they're not a derivative, they're not in the case. So there is a, um, an individual code that is family. Um, also abuser, if the, if the husband is the abuser, um, we usually create, at least in the SF office, we create a contact for that abuser so that his information is there. So it helps for the conflict check so that no one else is giving services to that person because he's the abuser in the case. Um, law enforcement agency, counselor, psychologist, other attorney if they have a deportation defense attorney or a different type of attorney, um, and also victim advocates as well if you're in touch with them a lot. So creating and editing them is the same process as creating and editing the blue client pages except the type will be different. So you can browse through the little the um, the scroll down menu to choose what type of, of contact you want. And they will have their own contact page, but no matter page per se, because they don't have their own retainer. But you can link them to matters, which are the clients that they're, that they're serving or the clients that they're related to. Um, for example, this below here, this contact screen is for the San Francisco Police Department certifying officer. And the class here is LEA for Law Enforcement Agency. Um, and then if you went into Linked Matters here, you'd see a long list of all of the cases that he has certified or that he's been working with. Um, a therapist Linked Matters would be a list of all of her patients that we have as clients. And um, it is important, if you can, remember to link your client's matter page to all of her social service agencies. There are links on that matter page that you can just click it and it'll say add link and you can click OK and then find their law enforcement agent or their therapist so that anyone who's working on that case will know who to contact for that. And then um, under the client's matter screen, if you go to their linked names tab, you can view all the linked names. In this case, it's small, but hopefully on your screen you can see this closer up. Um, this client is linked to himself, where it says applicant. That's his his own matter or contact page that has all his contact information. But he's also linked to his derivative daughter, his victim advocate, his certifying agency, and his therapist. So there's you know several people involved in this case that are all listed there under the matter page, linked names. So moving to a different subject, um, we're going to talk about creating events and deadlines. And there are three slots for deadlines on the immigration tab of the matter screen um, as it is set up now. So there's three different deadlines you can enter. Um, and these are, you know, hard deadlines or you could create deadlines for yourself if you're trying to remember um, to do something by a certain date. However, the deadlines here on the front page of the matter screen are not linked to anything. So it's kind of just at, at first glance opening the matter page, you see that. but they won't send you a reminder and they won't be in your calendar if you only put them here. So this is just the little deadline reminder thing, but there's also a tab, a separate tab called events, where you can create an actual event and set your abacus settings to remind you of that event so that you actually get a pop-up to tell you what to do. 
Um, so, but do use these two for whoever's opening this so that you, they can see your upcoming deadlines on the case, even if they're not linked. So here's the separate events tab. Um, and just like case notes, it's important to only add events to the matter screen, um, the golden screen related to the case. The blue screen, you would be adding an event that's only linked to the person itself. And so it makes more sense to link it to the retainer so you know what case the deadline is for. So if you go into events, again at the bottom of the screen, there's the add option. So if you click add, you'll get this green screen, which is an event. Um, so you can fill in all the fields as you want to and click save. And it's important to make your actual event and deadline for the day it occurs. Um, so for example, if my certification is going to expire on June 20th, 2012, um, I don't want to make this deadline for May 20th because it can be confusing like what's the actual date that it expires. The thing about the, the events that is convenient is that it does allow you to make a reminder for yourself and this number that you enter is a number of days. So when, if you enter reminders for yourself, it automatically clones the event to give you a reminder 30 days beforehand that says, reminder, this happens on June 20th, instead of the confusion of what day is the actual deadline. So for the when, put the actual expiration date or the actual deadline. Um, do put your initials here, and then what. Um, we're not actually making events for appointments yet, because um, we haven't integrated our calendar into Abacus yet. That might be happen in the future, but for now, you don't have to make an event here just for a declaration appointment, but this is just for an example. Um, so your event goes in the what screen, the when, time if you want to, where, and then the name and matter, you can put um, the client's full name there so that it links um, both ways to it. And then the matter field should always be the principal applicant. So here it says matter. That should be the principal so that you know what retainer it's connected to. But if you do have, if you're derivative, if the event only applies to the derivative in the case, where it says name, you can change this to put the derivative's name so that you're aware that the event is related only to that derivative. Um, so you can do that if you want to as well. And then you can also set an alarm. Uh, and that's going to be in this field where it says alarm. Um, so it didn't go into more detail about that, but just to explain it, if you click this arrow, it's going to give you several options, like one day, two weeks, for when you want your alarm to happen. And then if you click that, it'll give you a pop-up of um, your alarm when that happens. And then in the later section on troubleshooting, we'll explain how to make sure your alarms don't get sent to everyone in all three ICWIC offices. So keep that in mind, too. Um, so when you save your event, in this case, I made two reminders. So even though I only created one event, you see there are three separate links here. So one is the actual date of the deadline, and then there are two separate reminders that are going to show up in any event query. So that's helpful to remind yourself that there's a deadline coming up. Um, you can also, on these, when you're making an event, there's several options here. You can cancel, edit, print, or mark done, or clone any events. It is important that if you do finish your, for example, if my deadline is for my certification expiring, but I've, I filed a case long before that, it is important on, upon filing the case that you go into your events and mark done any event that you did complete so that in the future someone's not panicking because they think that wasn't done yet. So just highlight it and then click mark done and then it'll show, it'll say D for done and then in an event query it won't pop up as an imminent deadline. So important to do that too. Um, and then when you when should you create events? Um, deadlines definitely for when the supplement B expires or certification, when your U visa expires, if your medical exam expires, if you have an age out in your case, etc. Appointments, not yet. So we're not really doing that yet because we still have a separate Outlook program for all of our uh, calendar stuff. So don't worry about making an event for an appointment yet. That might be a future addition. And then also follow-up reminders for yourself, too. So if you, um, for example, if you submitted a certification request and you want yourself to know in three months from now, maybe I should check in with that certifier because it looks like they forgot or, you know, something, you can make an event, a little event for yourself to remind yourself to do that. Um, also, if, you're, if you need to check in with the Vermont Service Center about something, you can make an event for that. Um, and a note here, going back to what we said in the very beginning, 
If you create an event that is a hard deadline, you also need to add that deadline separately on the immigration tab of the matter screen because they're not linked to each other. So do that as well. And then here's the little troubleshooting thing. When you create a, an alarm for yourself or a reminder for yourself, make sure you need to make sure your abacus is set to only remind you. Otherwise, the entire three offices will get an alarm for your case. So to do that, and you only have to do this once, but basically the first time you're logging into your abacus or the first time you remember, go into calendar, the drop down menu, um, go into calendar, and then this is what you'll get, or first go into calendar, then click setup, and then you'll get this little, this little box, and then next to setup four, at the very top, you want that to say your initials. If it's set, the default setting is all. So if it says all, then you definitely need to change that to your just your own self. Um, so you can go to here, click who, and then in the scroll down menu, find yourself and click yourself and then click OK. And then if you go into it again, it should say set up for your initials only. Okay. And if you forget to do this, you'll know soon because someone will email you to tell you that everyone's getting your alarms. So make sure you do that when you can. Um, then just to go over some of the other tabs up here, they all have their, it's pretty straightforward once you get comfortable with it, um, to find out where staff members are or what they're working on. Like if you're a supervising attorney and you need to, if you're checking in on your, your legal assistants or caseworkers that are working with you, um, you can click on day to see the daily organizer. Thank you. Um, or you can click on staff to see the staff calendar too. And again, we're still using Outlook for the calendar now, so this um, might not be something you use often yet, but it's there. Um, so here, for example, clicking, we clicked on day, so it shows you a little daily organizer for the day, and it shows all of your personal reminders for that day, and then if there's any appointments that someone made in Abacus, they'll be listed here. Okay, um, daily organizer who function. So if you want to customize the calendar to show you the staff members of your program, um, you can click on one of the three calendar icons, day, week, or month, whichever one you're trying to look at, um, to, schedule, to see the schedule for everyone else's. And then click on one of the three, after you click on one of the three calendar icons, click on the Who button, and then it'll give you this drop down menu. And you can click on more than one person. So you can click on just one person if you're just wanting to see one person's schedule or events. Or you can click on every person that you're trying to follow or see, and it'll show you all of those deadlines for those people. And then to see today's events, you can click on events, and it'll show everything for the whole day. Um, these are just some more tips you can use for Abacus. Another thing that's important is the conflict check, which the intake coordinator will be doing this a lot, and also every time you do an intake, you're going to do it again. So basically, there's a little icon that says conflicts, and you want to click on that and enter your client's name, the abuser's name, and any names of clients in the case, um, and you can load all the names at once into the conflict check, and then click run, and it'll show you basically if there's any conflicts with other clients in Abacus, um, which is why it's important to fill out all the fields in Abacus. There's a perpetrator field on the matter screen, so whenever you get a case, you need to write the perpetrator's name so that that would come up in a conflict check for a different person. Um, so conflict checks are important. And then also to determine filing deadlines, you can use the date calculator. It's really convenient. If you get an RFE or something that says, in 87 days, we must re you know, have a response from you, you can put today's date and then a number of days, weeks, minutes, any, any unit of time, and then click OK, and it'll tell you the date that that ends up on. So that's what date calculator is. And then um, this the last note on closing abacus, it's really important to do file exit. Our technician, IT tech person has um, every night abacus backs up all of its data to save it. So if you exit by clicking the X, it does not allow your abacus to back up its data. So it's really important to do file exit so that it can do that. And then um, if you're logging out of the, so that's to log out of the Abacus program, but then you're still going to be logged into the Abacus server. So you need to go down to the start menu and click log off of the Abacus server. And then that'll go away and then you're still logged into the rest of your computer. So um, it's important to log out correctly of Abacus. 
Um, so this is another um, kind. This is kind of a troubleshooting type thing for a quick query or doing a query. Um, supervisors will use this. You can query any of the three things here, which are contacts, events, or matters. You can query any of them to get a lit, like a stats list of upcoming deadlines or clients that have, you know, Hernandez in their last name or have this year of birth. You can basically query for any like one piece of data. But the time that you'll maybe more commonly be using it if you're a caseworker or a volunteer is if you can't find something. Like if you can't find your client or you can't um, locate it, maybe the spelling of the name or something, you can try doing a query to find it. Um, so keep in mind what info you're searching for. If you're looking for biographic info, you're going to use contacts. If you're looking for a case-related thing, you're going to use the matter. If you're looking for a date or an event, then you're going to use events. But it's the same process no matter what, um, which of these icons you click on. So for an example here, we're going to use contacts, like pretend we're looking for a person. So click on the contacts, and then it's over here, the, once I clicked on it, this little box covered it, but there is a, an icon right under, hidden under there that says query. So if you click on that, it'll give you three choices for a quick query, query manager, or set current query as default. Query manager is more complicated. Um, if you're doing what I said earlier, if you're a supervisor and you want to see all of your caseworkers' deadlines and stuff, but quick query is what you're going to use if you're just looking for someone quickly. So quick, quick query, <laughs> it's a tongue twister. And then um, the matters and the events have the same query options too. So this is what will pop up when you click that. Um, and then you enter what you're looking for, enter what you know of the client, and then um, for here we just can do last name. And notice, this is important, notice the match all values box. So if that box is clicked, it will combine a query for all of the fields you entered, which will make it really specific. So if there's like one tiny thing wrong, it won't find what you're looking for. But if you're positive of this client's last name and their date of birth, you can use that to narrow it down even more. Um, here it says, for example, if you type a last name and a city, it will find all the people with a last name who also live in that city. So it's really specific. If this box is unclicked, um, it will give you all clients with the last name you entered or the city you entered. So it will give you more choices. Um, so leaving it unclicked will give you a broader search for that thing. Um, so it depends on what you're looking for. So enter your information that you know and click OK. Um, and when you click OK, a new screen will pop up that lists all the contact entries that include the information you entered. So here there's a couple clients that we created for this PowerPoint that have the last name of client, so it gave you two different options here. Um, and this is one thing, it gets more and more complicated as you're trying to find something, but the quick query function is a starts with search and not a contains search. So that's important um, distinction for when you're searching for something. For example, if you're looking for someone whose second last name might be Gomez, then the quick query will not find it because the field doesn't start with Gomez. So if their name is like Hanson Gomez and you just put Gomez, it's not going to find it. It's because it's looking for a starts with, which is H-A-N, not Gomez. Um, if you want to perform a more detailed contains search, that's when you have to do the query manager. Um, if, because if you only know the person's second last name, you're not going to find it through a quick query. You have to do a contained search. So it's a little more complicated. Um, so doing that, we're going to go through it quickly. And again, you, if you're doing this later, you're going to want to come back and look at this because it's really detail oriented. But so for a contains search, you're going to use the query manager under contact matters or events. Click query again, but this time choose query manager. And the query manager function is a way to algebraically create your own contains search. So you can kind of make your own formula for it. So here you can't, I think it cut off a little bit of this screen, but when you click the query manager, it'll give you a bunch of options. And what you want to do is click add because you're adding an entire query that you're creating. So click add first. Um, so quer queries cannot be repeated, so make a query ID and description based on your name, which you can do this. Um, and each new query you will do will be using the same query ID, but with whatever changes you want to the terms of the query. Um, so 
it's um, this is Abacus Tech's support suggestion um, that all Ikwik Abacus users, if you're going to plan on doing any query manager, you should create a query ID based on your own name and then use that for all your future contains queries. You can change everything about the query, but it, the fact that you have your own initials will make it faster for you to just go in and make your query under your own initials instead of creating a new one each time. Because then if you do that, the query ID list is going to be super long because it's going to be every query that was ever created. So it's good to just keep it under your initials. Um, or if you're a supervisor, you probably have certain queries that you always look back on, so that's a little different. But um, Yes, so add and then create a query based on your own initials. So this is what it does. Um, the example here, the query ID is just H. I just use my last initial because we have several Jessicas. Um, the description is my name, Jessica Hansen. And then click add to enter your query terms of this specific query. And remember, um, each time you do a new query, you can change all this. So click add. And then in, it'll give you this pop-up that says expression editor. So in expression editor, you have to think algebraically, which can be fun or not, depending on what you like. Um, so each space in this expression editor, there's probably four or five, maybe six fields. This is covering up some of them. But each space has a drop-down menu. Um, so for field, this example uses last because we're searching for their last name. And um, you can, but there's all the fields that are in Abacus for the whatever icon you clicked on, it'll give you all the different fields. You can choose any one that you wanted. Um, and then choose contains here in order, or any other command for your query. But this is the example of, like, say you only know the person's second last name. So you're looking for anything that that field contains. So here we used contains. And then in the value field, enter what you're looking for. So the search we just entered is going to pull up all the contact entries with the last name that contains the word client. So in this case, the client's fictional last name is client. Um, so the value that we want is client. In, this, in the other example I gave, if you're looking for someone whose name is Hanson Gomez, but you don't